Um, I started out um, covering Colombia as a researcher for the international human rights organization, Human Rights Watch, from 2004 to 2010. Um, that's me interviewing uh, a journalist in Barranquilla. Um, and uh, what I did was I traveled all over the country uh, and collected stories of people who were uh, affected by the internal armed conflict, people who had experienced uh, atrocities, had survived massacres, uh, killings, had witnessed uh, terrible things, people who were forcibly displaced by the conflict. Colombia uh, at the time had, I think, the second largest population of internally displaced people after Sudan. Um, there were millions of people who had been forced to flee their homes due to decades of conflict. Uh, the country had been at war for uh, many, many years, since the 1960s, uh, in a war involving the left-wing guerrillas of the FARC, as well as the guerrillas of the ELN, um, and the government, as well as these shadowy forces known as paramilitaries. Uh, and in that time, uh, all parties to the conflict had committed uh, horrific crimes, and that's part of what had, had led to um, this massive crisis of, of forced displacement. Um, I spent my time trying to convince the U.S. government and the Colombian government to stop the abuses, to address them, and uh, over time I started to become kind of frustrated at the stories that I saw emerging from Colombia um, and that people seemed to know here. Most Americans seem to know of Colombia as uh, the place that produced Pablo Escobar, um, the head of the Medellin cartel who was killed in 1993. That's 25 years ago now. Yet people still mainly talk about Pablo Escobar and, and fans of the show Narcos will know that, that that's still the main storyline that comes out of the country. Or um, people know about uh, DEA agents and heroic stories about law enforcement fighting drug traffickers. Uh, People who read the news will also know a little bit about the abuses committed by the FARC guerrillas. Uh, the FARC uh, were Marx, are a Marxist uh, guerrilla group uh, that started in the 60s. Um, in the 90s in particular, they started committing a lot of kidnappings. Uh, commi these were kidnappings for uh, political reasons in some cases. Uh, you know, they would uh, get prominent politicians. Um, in this case, this is Ingrid Betancourt, who was a presidential candidate who was taken hostage and held uh, in captivity for many years um, before she was rescued by the Colombian government. And people in the US seem to know these stories. Um, but the, the guerrillas also kidnapped people for ransom. Uh, they kidnapped thousands of people, in fact, for ransom as a way to fund their activities. Um, they uh, engaged in recruitment of children uh, to join their ranks. They used anti-personnel landmines, which left people maimed. Um, and also, you know, bombings and, and killings. Uh, but again, this was only part of the story. And when I was covering Colombia, there was a whole other piece that was not getting attention in the United States and that most um, people outside of Colombia knew very little about. And in fact, many Colombians tended to um, set aside. And that was the story of the right-wing paramilitary groups. Um, the paramilitaries, I was saying before, were these sort of shadowy groups that had existed for, for many years. Um, in the 80s, they became more prominent. Uh, in theory, they were a kind of counterinsurgency force. They were groups that claimed to have come together to fight the guerrillas, um, to protect communities from guerrilla incursion. Uh, the reality is that usually they were more like private armies for powerful landowners, um, businessmen, to defend their interests. And perhaps more importantly, they were uh, deeply involved in drug trafficking. And they were often uh, death squads working for drug traffickers to protect drug traffickers' interests. Um, they worked very closely with sectors of the Colombian military. Uh, 
And in the late 90s, uh, Human Rights Watch and other groups were trying to get the attention of the US government and saying, you know, if you're giving resources to the Colombian military, bear in mind that the military is tolerating in many cases, or in some cases even colluding with these paramilitary groups. And the paramilitary groups were committing horrific atrocities, uh, especially at the end of the 90s. They, they began this rapid expansion campaign across much of the country uh, using terror as a way to exert control. Uh, so they would go into a small town, force all of their members to come out to the town uh, square, and, uh, and then proceed to uh, massacre a large number of people, often torturing them, often committing a, a series of other crimes uh, at the same time in the process, uh, as a way to spread fear and um, get people to flee their communities. And often uh, the whole town would just leave afterwards uh, and become, join the ranks of the internally displaced living in slums uh, on the edges of cities. Uh, so this over here is a photo of a woman who, an Afro-Colombian woman from the region of Choco, a very, very poor region, um, who had been forced to flee her home after paramilitaries uh, went into her, her area and, and seized the territory. She went back years later and tried to rebuild her house and um, even, the paramilitaries supposedly by then were gone but they had been replaced by uh, their successors by other groups that were connected to them. And when she rebuilt her house, they once again um, tore it down and she's sitting on the remains of her house. So, so that's the sort of story that, that we saw over and over in Colombia. But at the same time, there was yet another piece that wasn't coming out of Colombia. I mean, there was a whole story of the paramilitaries and their expansion and their links to the government. Uh, but there were also more positive stories. I got to know so many Colombians who, despite all of the pressures around them to join forces with organized crime, or at least to look away from what was happening around them, um, insisted on standing up for basic human dignity um, and fighting for truth and justice. Uh, these were often you know, very ordinary people um, standing up for, for rights within their world. So this is a photo of a young woman uh, at the um, Youth Network in Medellin, uh, which was a group of teenagers and early 20-somethings who got together um, to support each other uh, and resist pressure from armed groups in Medellin to join them. Um, and this is very difficult to do. Medellin's poor neighborhoods, uh, even when this was taken in 2008, were run uh, by successor groups of the paramilitaries, gangs, and not to join them meant risking your life. Uh, yet these kids refused to join, insisted on fighting for, for their right to decide what they wanted to do with their lives and they banded together and they were getting threats all the time and you know I know of uh, very young people who did lose their lives because they stood up to these gangs but um, but they insisted on doing so uh, and I, I love that image just the the courage and um, defiance uh, in there uh, is is Wonderful, um, <clears throat> and maybe we see a little bit of that in, in kids in the US today. Um, but the thing is, I wanted to tell some of these stories of brave, committed people who, in the midst of everything that was pushing against them, stood up for what was right. And so I started with the story of this man, whose name is, his name is Ivan Velasquez. He, um, when I got to know him, was an assistant justice on the Colombian Supreme Court. Uh, the Colombian Supreme Court had jurisdiction to investigate members of Congress, um, conduct criminal investigations of members of Congress. And as an assistant justice, Ivan was an investigator. Uh, 
And in 2005, Iwan was sitting in his office and he received a complaint, uh, very short, just one paragraph, saying the paramilitary leaders who are in peace negotiations with the government and say that they're demobilizing have claimed that they have friends in 35% of Congress. Please investigate, period. Not much to go on. But Ivan decided that he would investigate because that's just the kind of person he was. And uh, he started combing through old case files in the Supreme Court, which you know, many other people might have looked at in the past and decided this is too dangerous to touch, I'm not going there. Well, he decided to look at them and he started piecing together uh, what links there might be between Congress and the paramilitaries. And again, around then people had heard a lot about links between paramilitaries and the military or the police, but very few people, actually nobody was talking about links between paramilitaries and Congress. Uh, and uh, Ivan's investigations, though, um, took off and he found uh, lots of evidence linking members of Congress to electoral fraud committed by paramilitaries uh, in state after state. You know, they had engaged in this rapid expansion campaign at the end of the 90s using terror um, and in the early 2000s. And then they had um, achieved so much control over much of the country that they were the ones in charge. And politicians would go to them and say, help me out, I want to be your person. Um, and the, the paramilitaries would threaten uh, voters or would just tell them to stay home and they would fill out their ballots for them and it was pretty easy to commit electoral fraud. And um, you know, Ivan's investigations combined with some academic research that showed highly irregular voting patterns in, in territory where paramilitaries had a presence um, combined to uh, produce what was known as the parapolitics scandal. Uh, over links between paramilitaries and Congress. And, and uh, it resulted in about a third of Congress getting uh, charged or convicted of colluding with paramilitaries. Uh, so this is really remarkable in a place where hardly anyone was held accountable for atrocities, for such powerful people as members of Congress, very prominent senators, the cousin of the president, um, who was the president of Congress, uh, uh, getting convicted of this. Um, for this to happen was a huge deal and uh, sent, I think, a very powerful message to many Colombians. It, it provided hope. It also deeply unsettled uh, the president, um, President Uribe, who proceeded to uh, attack Ivan Velasquez and conduct a smear campaign against him, basically. But more on that later. Um, so I started researching Ivan's story. I started talking to him at length uh, about, um, about what had happened and why he did what he did. And at one point he gave me a copy of a speech that he had given in 2011 um, when he was accepting a human rights award from the International Bar Association. And in the speech, Ivan quoted from Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. Uh, there's a passage in, in that book that talks about um, how one of the main characters, Jose Arcadio Segundo, uh, witnesses a massacre. 2,000 people get killed. Uh, it's called the Massacre of the Banana Companies. And he, after witnessing this massacre, he survives, he escapes, he goes to his hometown of Macondo and he tells people, look, I saw all of these dead people. It was terrible. Um, I've never seen anything like that. And the people in Macondo say, no, no, that's not possible. There are no dead here. Since the time of your great uncle, there have been no dead here in Macondo. And, um, you know, that's obviously the title of the book, uh, but it's also, um, something that Ivan used in his speech to make an additional point. He says, you know, he, he wanted to give this award, um, or, or this award he, he felt was really an honor, not just of him, but of all of the Jose Arcadio Segundos who had spoken the truth 
about what was happening in their country but had been ignored. And in particular, Ivan said, he wanted to dedicate the award to one such Jose Arcadio Segundo, one such person called Jesus Maria Valle, who had spoken the truth about the links between the paramilitaries and the military and had been killed for it. And this was a good friend of Ivan's. So that story had clearly left a deep impression on Ivan and it led me to look into the story of Jesus Maria Valle. Um, that's Valle there sitting surrounded by uh, people who had been displaced um, and who he had helped to find shelter in Medellin and they were having a birthday party for the children. Um, he uh, was a human rights activist in Medellin. In the 1980s, he uh, took over the leadership of the main human rights organization in Medellin after three of its leaders had been killed in rapid succession. Um, yet he took that on and uh, went on to be a very outspoken, much loved activist in Medellin, uh, speaking out for all sorts of people who were uh, vulnerable and marginalized and, and abused, uh, including displaced people um, who were not treated well in the city, of course, but also including people in rural areas around Medellin and, and the state of Antioquia, which is where Medellin is based. Um, Valle was uh, originally from a rural region called Ituango, out in the outskirts of Medellin, several hours out. And uh, he had worked the land as a child. Eventually he had moved to Medellin and, and uh, he'd become a lawyer. Uh, but he'd, he'd kept very strong ties to Ituango and, and his roots there and was very attached. He became a councilman for Ituango even as he was doing all these other things and he would routinely on weekends drive out to Ituango or, or take the bus eight hours out there um, and talk to the people. So he knew when in 1996 the paramilitaries started to show up in the region and he uh, knew when they started killing people. And he started reporting that and, and going to the media and going to the 4th Brigade of the Army that was based in Medellin and going to the office of the then governor, Mr. Alvaro Uribe, who would later be president, um, and asking them to take action to stop these killings by the paramilitaries. And he got no response. Um, I talk about one meeting that a witness says uh, Valle held with the then governor uh, in which he said, look, they're killing all these people uh, and the military is there and they're not doing anything to stop it. And I think they're working together. And Governor Uribe allegedly got up, went to the phone, called the head of the 4th Brigade and said, uh, General Manosalva, I have Valle here. He's making false accusations against you. I think uh, this deserves um, a lawsuit for defamation. And, uh, but you know, maybe you wanna talk to him. And then Valle went on and had a meeting with, with the general later on. But months later, he did get sued for defamation by a member of the army. Uh, and and uh, it got, things got very tense for him. Uh, he kept speaking out, kept insisting that the paramilitaries and the military were working together, kept asking the state to do something to save the poor defenseless people of, of Ituango uh, and getting nowhere. Um, and at one point he started talking about how paramilitaries were entering uh, this part of Ituango called El Aro. Uh, they were going towards a small town of 300 people. Uh, he learned because neighbors saw the paramilitaries approaching and, uh, and he got phone calls and he and others warned the authorities, we think there's gonna be a massacre in El Aro. This is October, 1997. Uh, and uh, please do it, do something, stop it. Um, and they were told, oh, well, let's have a meeting in a few days. It's, we're having elections this Sunday. We can't leave the barracks. We can't do anything. Um, 
and they didn't do anything. And uh, over the course of several days, that October, the paramilitaries went into the town of Elaro, took all the townspeople out uh, into the church, uh, eventually killed 17 people, including a 14-year-old boy, uh, raped a number of women, uh, tortured some people, and uh, eventually burned down the town and left with 1,200 heads of cattle, um, forcing all remaining townspeople to flee. That's a photo taken the week after the massacre. Um, so you can see the, the town's burned oh. down and uh, no roofs left. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, this, this massacre uh, really set Valle off and he became even more outspoken and said, you know, the military knew about this. Uh, he said there were people who saw military helicopters flying overhead as the massacre was happening. Um, he testified in, uh, in the case over the Alano massacre and said that he believed that there was uh, a sort of tacit uh, agreement uh, among the governor's office, the military, and the paramilitaries, allowing this to move forward. Um, and he, uh, and he um, testified again in February uh, in the case against him for defamation and, and repeated the same allegations, tried to turn the defamation case into an, uh, an opportunity to get the authorities to investigate what was happening. And two days after he testified, uh, he was assassinated by men who went to his office in Medellin. So <clears throat> this, this case left a deep impression on Ivan Velasquez, who was then chief prosecutor in Antioquia and went to Valle's office the day the murder happened um, afterwards. And, uh, and Velasquez tried to um, push his team to investigate paramilitaries, um, and they had some successes. They, uh, at one point, uh, conducted a, a search uh, of a, a site that had been identified as, as potentially a paramilitary base, and they found all of the paramilitaries' accounting records and their accountant, um, which should have been a huge blow to the paramilitaries, but they then proceeded to murder uh, 11 of his investigators, uh, and for mysterious reasons, the National Office of the Attorney General in Bogota took the case away um, from him. And he was eventually asked to resign, although people claim that that's not true. Uh, I mean, the people who asked him to resign claim that he resigned, so it's all very murky there. Um, but uh, that you know, clearly was something that left a deep impression on him uh, and shaped probably his desire years later when he investigated the parapolitics scandal to, to get to the bottom of, of who was behind all of this violence. My book also talks about a third character, uh, a man called Ricardo Calderon, who I also got to know in Colombia. And I don't have a photo of him because uh, he's an, an investigative journalist who uh, always, uh, well, he's, he's, he works for the Colombia's main news magazine, Semana, um, and he publishes all these incredible investigative pieces unsigned. Uh, there are no photos of him available uh, publicly, um, but that's a photo of a poster that he has in his office <laughs> so, that I associate with him, so that'll stand in for him. Um, and. The interesting thing about Ricardo is uh, that, you know, well, like Valle, like Ivan Velasquez, deeply committed to the truth, um, but his story is also intertwined with Velasquez's because um, Ricardo started to uh, get to know the paramilitaries uh, because he was documenting their massacres in the late 90s, and um, they got upset when they saw him writing stories in, in the news magazine about what they were doing. And so they would start calling him and saying, hey, please correct your story. And he would argue with them. And eventually they invited him to come out to their camps. 
um, so they could explain to him why what they were doing was so great for the country. And so he went out to their camps and he started uh, to see that members of the intelligence service were also showing up at the camps and senior government officials were also showing up at the camps and what were they doing there? So that um, led him to a number of investigations including one that showed how um, the head of the intelligence service had been colluding with the paramilitaries around 2005. Uh, so that was a big story. But then when Ivan Velasquez had been, had broken all of these stories about, uh, or had investigated the collusion between the paramilitaries and members of Congress, and President Uribe had in turn started this smear campaign against Velasquez, Calderon ended up exposing how paramilitaries were entering the presidential palace to plot with senior presidential advisors ways to get evidence against Velasquez uh, to undermine his investigations. So this was critical because if Calderon had not exposed that, it, it's very, you know, it, it's quite likely that uh, the president's office would have been successful in, uh, in undermining Velasquez, that, that they might have been able to really discredit him in, in, in the public eye. But once it became clear that, that this was part of a plot with the paramilitaries, that all started to fall apart. And over time, other truths emerged, and I won't give it all away, um, uh, but eventually, uh, it turned out that the whole intelligence service had been engaged in extensive illegal spying uh, of Velasquez and other members of the Supreme Court, of journalists, of human rights activists, of opposition politicians, and ultimately that led to the closure of the intelligence service. And over time, many senior officials in the Uribe administration ended up getting prosecuted and convicted of colluding with the paramilitaries or engaging in various other crimes. Um, so, so, in a way, um, they prevailed. Velázquez and Calderón did expose the truth of what was happening with the paramilitaries. That doesn't mean that everything is now fine in Colombia. Uh, and many of you might have heard that uh, Colombia has had a peace process in the last couple of years with the FARC guerrillas. And uh, the FARC has supposedly uh, disarmed and is entering the political system. Uh, I hope that that helps. Um, it's certainly the case that uh, if the FARC really does leave, that you're removing a, an actor from the conflict that is still ideological in part. But the reality is also that Colombia's war has for many years not really been about ideology. It's been about profits. Um, it's been about drugs. Uh, since the 80s, really, all, all actors in Colombia's armed conflict have been motivated, uh, well, you know, have, have funded their activities through drug trafficking, at least in part, but also the drug trafficking has become an end in itself. And that was certainly the case for the paramilitaries uh, who replaced Pablo Escobar as the country's biggest drug traffickers. And so that's the chapter that you don't normally hear. Escobar died, and if you've seen Narcos, um, the Pepes, who are the people persecuted by Escobar, who were his associates, were involved in killing him. They were also the paramilitary leaders, and they took over the reins of the Medellin cartel's drug trafficking business. Um, so even though they were claiming to be an, a counterinsurgency force, they were also major, major drug traffickers. And when they were going into small towns like El Aro and killing people and terrorizing people, it wasn't about uh, keeping the guerrillas out or um, about politics. It was about control of strategic corridors through which they could move cocaine. Uh, it was about control of access routes to the ocean. Uh, or it was about control of, of territory where cocoa was being produced. Um, and I fear that even if the FARC does fully demobilize, you're going to have ongoing problems in Colombia because you still have an illicit market 
in drugs, um, fueled by prohibition. And that market is incredibly powerful. Uh, when you have a country where uh, scores, thousands of young men uh, cannot get a job where, that pays the minimum wage, yet organized crime offers them salaries that far exceed that, uh, they're going to go for organized crime. And the more resources we put into uh, going after organized crime through law enforcement, one, the more profitable the business becomes. And um, ultimately, uh, it doesn't change anything because just like Escobar was replaced by the paramilitaries and the paramilitaries after they supposedly demobilized were replaced by their successors who remained intact and, and the FARC is being replaced by factions of the FARC that remain active or by successors of the paramilitaries who are going to fill that space. You know, that's going to keep happening. Again, because the profits are just too big and someone's always willing to take that risk. So, you know, that's one reason and this connects to my work now that uh, I ended up getting very interested in drug policy reform, uh, in ending the war on drugs, because to me that's a root cause of all of this. And I could spend all my time trying to get the Colombian government and the US government to stop the abuses in Colombia, but you know, the US was pouring billions of dollars into the Colombian military, um, you know, a little bit into, uh, into the justice system or into law enforcement, uh, but Ultimately, they were helping one group of drug traffickers against another. <laughs> um, and even if they were fighting all of them, it, it, it wouldn't change because people are always getting replaced. This is a never-ending cycle. So anyway, that, enough of my lecturing about the war on drugs. But, um, but I think that there are some serious questions about the future of the country. All that being said, I think that the stories of Ivan Velasquez, Jesus Maria Valle, and Ricardo Calderon should give us hope because they did make changes happen in their country. You know, they won't change everything. We need to address some of these underlying factors. But the fact that ultimately the intelligence service was shuttered and the fact that so many important truths about the paramilitaries and their links to many different sectors of the state came out changed the debate in the country. It made it impossible for Colombians to keep denying what was right under their noses for years. Um, you know, this, I call it a story of murder and denial in Colombia because for so many years people said, no, there are no dead here. There are no paramilitaries. There are no paramilitaries working with the military for sure. Uh, and no, with the government, of course not. Uh, now you can't deny that. It's totally clear. And, and that changes the starting place. And it means that there are many Colombians who have been emboldened to demand uh, that more truth come out and to uh, ask for, for justice and, and for um, just a different uh, way of treating the people. Um, so, you know, you still have President Uribe, former President Uribe now being the most, uh, the, the senator who's won the largest number of votes in Colombian history in the last few weeks in elections, but I think over the long term and in the big picture, there is a sea change in the way people think and talk in Colombia, and that matters. And I think it's something that should give hope to people in the United States as well when we're dealing with challenging situations, that ordinary people who insist on fighting for justice, for truth, uh, for human dignity, can make a difference. And if they could do it there, uh, they can do it here too. So uh, let me just read you a little portion of the book. Um, and this is about Valle and um, after the Alaro massacre and when he was making all of his, uh, when he was really getting um, extremely outspoken, having very difficult uh, conf confrontations with with the governor and the military. Valle's sparrow-like sister, Nellie, who had been his secretary for years, had first noticed her big brother was afraid in December 1997, two months after the Alaro massacre. 
At the end of the workday, Valle would look over his shoulder as they got into a taxi. He asked her to keep her son from watching TV in a room with a window overlooking the street, which he felt was too exposed. At one point, he urged her to find some other place to live. She had been hurt, thinking he was mad at her. She didn't realize it was because he didn't want her to be there when they killed him. Velázquez and J. Guillermo Escobar had tried to convince Valle to seek protection. Valle was getting a lot of public exposure in the media and his accusations against the military were the kind of statements, thought Velázquez, that got you killed. Valle's campaign was also making many people, not only members of the military, increasingly angry. As Velázquez waited to enter a meeting at the governor's office one day, he overheard Uribe's, Uribe's deputy, businessman Pedro Juan Moreno, speaking mockingly about Valle as that nutcase with his accusations. Later on, Velázquez recalled that there had been huge hostility by Pedro Juan and Uribe toward Valle. The minute Valle made an accusation, which he would make public through the newspaper El Colombiano or radio stations, there would be a strong reaction from the military or the governorship. International human rights organizations offered to buy Valle an airplane ticket out of the country. Even if it was just for six months, Velázquez and J. Guillermo argued, he should go, at least until things calm down a bit. But Valle refused. Why would Valle stay knowing he might get killed? Years later, Velázquez agreed that it was hard to understand. But Valle was one of those people, he said, who could die of sadness if he fled. No, more than sadness, shame. For someone as attached to his people as Valle was, leaving was not an option. When he talked about my town, my people, he wasn't speaking rhetorically. He was talking about his people. So Valle continued taking taxis to his office and walking from there to the courthouses and prosecutor's offices for hearings and meetings. At least, Velázquez and J. Guillermo agreed, they would try to get him some bodyguards. With the exception of his closest friends, few people continued to associate with him. Many of his acquaintances now kept their distance. Valle started getting phone calls from people who would then hang up, threats or perhaps attempts by his enemies to keep tabs on him. But Valle was also filled with indignation. After his fight with Uribe and the 4th Brigade over his claims about links between the military and the paramilitaries, he had no more peace, recalled Gloria Manco, a former student of Valles who was close to the activist. He had his moments of reading, he was a man who loved books, but after that point he didn't have those pleasures. His last days were supremely difficult because he could not derive joy even from the smallest things. And then a little bit later, when she came back from lunch, Nellie saw two men at the door. They were wearing suits and ties and carrying briefcases. Thinking they were clients, she unlocked the door to the little reception area that led into Valle's office. But as Nellie started to go into the office to greet her brother, the men shoved past her, pushing her into a chair across from Valle, who looked startled for a second. Then, realizing what was about to happen, Valle turned to his sister, and held her gaze firmly. Stay calm, Nellie, we're here now. He let the men grab him. At some point, a, wom a woman slipped into the office and helped them tie Nellie and Jaramillo up on the floor near the door. Then one of the men pulled out a gun and put something on it, a silencer. Be quiet, one of them hissed. They forced Valle to lie face down on the floor in a corner of his office next to the window and tied him up there by his hands and feet. Nellie couldn't tear her eyes away from Valle's face as one of the men put the gun to her brother's head. She screamed when they shot him. I released this book on February 27 of this year, which was exactly 20 years since that happened. Um, and for me, it's, uh, it's, it's been wonderful to, in a way, um, offer some kind of tribute to him uh, through this book and try to tell another piece of the story uh, to people who don't know it. Uh, and I've been very, very pleased that many Colombians have, um, have really appreciated um, this coming out because it's not known enough. So thank you for being here and also uh, listening to this story. Uh, the paramilitaries would claim that they were defending the country from the guerrillas, and they would claim that the people they were killing were guerrilla um, associates or sympathizers. 
uh, or they would say that the facts of the case weren't exactly as described by the journalists, right? So Calderon would actually go to the site of a massacre and after it had happened, he would talk to the survivors and he would get the real story, uh, but then the paramilitaries would call him and say, no, 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 there was a confrontation with the guerrillas and you know, the people who died were actually guerrillas, not civilians. Uh, and so that was a way that they covered it up for a very long time. And a lot of people wanted to hear that version, you know. A lot of people wanted to think that the paramilitaries were, uh, were defending them. And to some Colombians, the paramilitaries are still heroes. Although that's a small minority, I think. Yeah, I'm just curious, what's happening with the military aid from the U.S. to Colombia right now that the government uh, is still at the same level? I know the Trump aid is going to Colombia in the near future uh, as part of the Latin America tour. Yeah, no, it's been declining for years um, since the Obama administration. They started cutting, and uh, and Trump is actually threatening to cut it even further uh, because he's claiming that Colombia is not cooperating on counter narcotics, which is uh, sort of bizarre. Um, it, it's in response to Colombia's decision to stop aerial fumigation of coca crops, uh, which the U.S. likes to do, and they fumigate the coca crops with essentially Roundup. Um, but which uh, the World Health Organization has said produces cancer. And so the Colombians understandably have said, no, we're not going to start pouring or keep pouring this all over our people. And there has been an increase in coca crops, um, in coca production, although that may also be linked to the FARC uh, peace process and the fact that the government is offering various uh, benefits to people who transition from growing coca into growing uh, alternative crops. And so maybe more people were growing coca so that they could then get more benefits that way. Um, so it's a complicated picture, but uh, this is a government that in many ways is trying to do things differently and, and uh, Trump is kind of beating them over the head, wanting them to do the same old thing. Yeah. Could you just uh, briefly give us a summary of your knowledge of the current government? Like, you mentioned that you're really just you know, aggressive government policy now. Um, can you just summarize the state of it and then give some of your thoughts and what, what you're recommending as far as any changes? Yeah, I mean, so I run the Drug Policy Alliance and we fight for an end to the war on drugs. Uh, you know, the Trump administration has uh, been trying to double down on the war on drugs and really, really ramp up the more punitive aspects of it. And you saw just la in the last few days, Trump uh, has called for the death penalty for drug offenders, um, which uh, one is utterly ineffective. Um, the US has had extremely harsh sentences uh, for drug trafficking for decades now. Um, we've never seen a supply or a, a, a meaningful decline in supply or use, problematic use of drugs in this country, uh, despite decades of the war on drugs. Um, two, it's cruel, it's dehumanizing. Uh, it makes uh, drug offenders out to be these monsters when in fact, many of the people who are targeted uh, for prosecution under these very harsh uh, laws are actually people who use drugs themselves, often people who are selling small amounts to support their own habit, um, or very poor people who have limited options and are selling small amounts. People who are caught in the United States usually uh, for drug offenses are not you know, the paramilitary leaders. <laughs> They're not major kingpins. Um, that's a very, very tiny minority. And you have devastating harm uh, in Colombia uh, with organized crime being fueled by, by the war on drugs, but also devastating harm in the United States with uh, 1.25 million people every year being arrested for nothing more than uh, possessing drugs for personal use and then often being saddled with a criminal record. And uh, overwhelmingly, those are black and brown people, even though they use drugs at exactly the same rates as whites. Um, but that's because of the decisions that uh, police departments have made about where to put their resources. Again, in the name of fighting drugs. Uh, you know, there are whole other 
set of harm, there's a whole other set of harms that has to do with health because when we've invested so many resources in criminalizing and locking people up uh, in military uh, aid and so on, we've taken away the possibility of putting those resources into public health interventions that would actually work at helping people who do have problematic drug use and that might actually save lives in the overdose crisis that we have in the United States. Other countries do things very differently. Uh, Canada has authorized 30 supervised consumption sites uh, to deal with their overdose crisis because they're getting fentanyl too. And um, you know, people who have access to supervised consumption sites where they can consume their drugs under the supervision of a trained professional um, don't die. And that's a starting place. And then they can get often referrals to treatment or other forms of support if they want and need it. Um, you know, there are many, many steps that we could be taking, uh, providing much more medication-assisted treatment, for example, for people who are struggling with opioid dependence. Um, Trump has talked a little bit about that, but he hasn't really put his money where his mouth is. Uh, and again, much more of the emphasis has been on the old school, criminalize, lock people up, kill people, yeah, approach. What about co-collaboration between the U.S. and the Colombian government to solve some of the problems in the economy in Colombia? It sounds like, you know, if you, if the lifestyle is, and the, you know, incentive to make money is there for, go, you know, for young, young entrepreneurs, um, you know, going to the tracking business, but, yeah. you know, could there be some reforms to generate I think Colombia has a lot of other opportunities um, for people, uh, and yet, I mean, obviously there is a problem with poverty and, and organized crime being attractive to people, but I think even with a lot of legal options, they're still not as profitable as cocaine trafficking. I mean, these people become multi-millionaires. I mean, Pablo Escobar was one of the richest men in the world in the 80s. Um, it's, it's just not comparable. And, um, and also, it's not just about the brutality that these groups engage in to maintain their control, it's also about their power to corrupt. Uh, they have so much wealth that they can then buy off authorities, and so it has this corrosive effect on the entire state, on democratic institutions, and it's uh, the same problem you see it not just in Colombia, but in Mexico and in Afghanistan, where we've been pouring billions of dollars into a country now for how long? And a big part of the issue there is corruption, and it's the fact that both the Taliban and many of the warlords also profit from drug trafficking. So, yeah, in the back. Okay, so, you kind of get the impression that they really don't want to stop that. And so I remember, uh, in the early 90s, uh, Jacques Cousteau made a documentary, a really famous one about this, Colombia. And uh, the CIA did a report that said that 90% of the dollars that Mexico and Colombia, uh, their foreign, the, the money that they use to pay their debts to the World Bank and the the IMF and the uh, big multinational banks in the United States comes from the drug trade. If there was no drug trade, uh, they couldn't get those dollars to pay off their debts. And uh, furthermore, um, you know, I just kind of consider the uh, prohibition to be the Foreign Commodity, Illegal Commodity Support Act, because that's basically what it, it operates. And so that kind of connects to the empire I wonder if you want to actually venture there. Um, you know, I think it's kind of hard to to piece together what all the interests are and where people stand. I think that part of the story is certainly that there are agencies of the U.S. government that exist to enforce drug laws, and that's their mindset. And uh, you know, if you had a different approach, then they would lose all their resources and their reason for being, um, or a lot of it. Uh, so that's one set of interests that plays into this. You know, li like you see often police departments refusing or objecting to criminal justice reforms at a local level uh, because 
they like their resources and like they like having reasons to arrest people. Not all of them. There are many, many people who are standing up and saying they want to see reforms, but you do see this trend. Um, you know, it's very hard to say. Uh, certainly, there are a lot of people who benefit from the drug trade who are not just the major drug traffickers, and it's hard to say who's conscious of it and how that plays out. But uh, I'm wondering. Um, I feel like with uh, you replacing Ethan Neumann, Neumann as the head of the DPA, I'm wondering what are the specific ways, what are the things that means for specific DPA initiatives in the Andean region in general? Is, does it change where resources are going? Um, not in any immediate way. I mean, uh, yes, I have replaced Ethan. I'm originally from Peru, and I've worked in Colombia, uh, and I care deeply about what's going on in those countries. DPA has always done some amount of international work, uh, but it's also overwhelmingly focused on changing U.S. drug policy, and uh, that's where we have uh, added value right now, and, and I think that we're going to keep focusing on that while maintaining uh, our international work and adjusting it to make sure it's as strategic as possible. That doesn't necessarily mean it'll be in the Andean region. We'll, we'll have to see what makes the most sense uh, in the overall picture. Where are we going to have the biggest impact? So, so I, I lived and worked in Colombia from January 97 to April 99. And I went back and worked there periodically from April 2011 to 2014. So I basically was out of the country for the whole Uribe. And um, it was when, when I worked there in the late 90s, it was uh, especially for a, you know, a gringo, <laughs> working for a multinational, it was super body insecurity. And I went back 12 years later and I, I didn't recognize the country. You know, and I know there was a lot of atrocities and bad things that happened on both sides, but I'm curious if uh, you might comment on some of the positive developments that happened, including uh, peace in the country. Yeah, I mean, Uribe, um, one reason people love Uribe in many cases, and why the U.S. has held him out as a success story and Colombia out as a success story, is that uh, with the resources from Plan Colombia, the military did go after the FARC very aggressively. And a big source of insecurity for people who lived in cities um, and for foreigners who went into the country was the, the high rate of kidnappings. It was just, it, it was extremely dangerous for many people. Um, to travel throughout the country on the major highways, you couldn't do it because it was just too high of a risk, and even living in the city. Um, and pushing the FARC out of those areas did mean an end to the kidnappings. It me meant a reduction in the conflict between the guerrillas and paramilitaries or the military or others in cities or around cities. Uh, the FARC was pushed way out into rural areas. And even as early as 2002, um, it, this combined with the paramilitaries also having, by 2002, 2003, effectively taken over control of important parts of the country. And with the FARC no longer there, they didn't have as much reason to kill, right? They, they were just exerting their control. So when I was covering Colombia, I wasn't seeing uh, a ton of fresh massacres. They were still happening. But what, what I was seeing was very tight control, often by paramilitary groups, in neighborhoods that wasn't obvious. It wasn't visible to the naked eye. But when you went and interviewed people, it turned out that, yeah, all the shopkeepers were paying a tax to the local paramilitary group, um, and in Medellin in particular, I'm thinking of. Um, and, uh, you know, if anybody got out of line, they would get threatened or they might disappear. But it became much more selective, much more targeted. Uh, you know, Dramatic violence uh, is is not something that they just engage in because they want to, because it's you, it's fun or, or whatever. It's because it's useful to them, and that kind of uh, terror that they engaged in in the late '90s and early 2000s was was a tactic uh, 
to seize control and to push the FARC out and to push out whole communities. Once they had control, it was not necessary, and so they didn't. It's much better to keep a low profile. And by then, the paramilitaries were trying to enter into peace negotiations with the Colombian government, also because um, the U.S., under intense pressure from human rights groups, uh, was starting to say that they were going to, um, and from others, that they were going to uh, put more pressure on Colombia on the paramilitaries. So um, John Ashcroft announced uh, that the uh, paramilitaries were going to be put on the U.S. list of foreign terrorist organizations in 2002 or three. Um, they also uh, announced extradition requests for many of the top paramilitary commanders. So again, they after that, the paramilitaries started keeping a lower profile. Um, but the underlying issue of control remains deeply problematic, and you could have. Um, new violence, and you still have violence, uh, connected to turf battles or whenever you have changes in that control. So uh, just in the last year, um, there's been a lot of uh, coverage of the fact that many uh, community leaders in Colombia are getting killed. Again, it's not mass violence, it's selective killings. But apparently this has to do with them standing up to groups coming into territory that the FARC is leaving behind and asserting their control over it. So it's the dynamics have changed. Definitely there's been a reduction in homicides, a reduction in kidnappings. It's much, much safer for um, non-Columbians and for even many Colombians who live in certain environments. Uh, but it's not safe for people who are in the territories that that the armed groups need to control to run their businesses. Have people been able to return to their communities where they were driven out? There's been an effort uh, by the current government to provide land restitution. Uh, it's worked uh, only in a, f a small number of cases compared to the problem. Uh, in part, that's because uh, some people have tried to go back and found that armed groups are still there and don't want their control to be messed with, and so then they're threatened and forced out again. Um, in other cases, it's been hard to prove that they are owners of the land because over so many years, you know, paramilitaries can, let's say paramilitaries or the FARC, control a certain region. They have control of the, of the land registry. They can alter all the documents. Um, other people never had uh, paperwork to begin with, uh, showing that they owned the land. Uh, so it, it's really a complex thing to, to tackle.